Okay, let's get started. Welcome, everyone. Thank you for joining us on our educational series. Um, today, we've got a very exciting topic, very uh, one of the fastest growing segments of Regen Medicine, uh, protein concentration. Um, but before we get into that, we'd want to just highlight uh, a conference that Advanced Regen Medicine Institute has coming up. Uh, one of the highlights of the year, we have speakers coming from Mayo, Harvard, Cedar sinai um, uh, Duke, and some of the best private practice for gen medicine experts in the country and in the world, speakers from all over the country, including Dr. De Castro, who you'll be uh, hearing from here shortly. Uh, so to, to find that, it's if you just search Advanced for Gen Medicine Institute, you'll find the link to get registered. There's breakout sessions, keynote speakers, hands-on rotations, and, and of course, as you can see, incredible faculty that, that will be joining there for the conference. Um, throughout the lecture, if you do have questions that come up on um, protein concentration, or as some people call it, A2M, uh, type in the question under the Q&A, and, uh, and then at the end, we'll have a Q&A session with Dr. De Castro. So go ahead and just type your questions as they come up. We'll start collecting them and then, uh, and then answer them at the end. So to introduce uh, my good friend, Jim De Castro, he is an expert in regen medicine, has been doing regen medicine for a long, long time, uh, published many various chapters and articles and research papers on various regen medicine topics. He is the medical director for SmartMD in the Philippines and also the current president of American Academy of Board and Board of Regen Medicine for the Asia chapter. Uh, he is he specializes in physical medicine and rehabilitation and uh, just a really phenomenal person. He started doing protein concentration long before most people knew what that is and, and really a pioneer in the field with, with some great um, uh, history and uh, life experiences and, and research behind that. So without further ado, we'll turn the time over to you, Dr. DeCastro. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dan, for inviting me to this forum. and. Uh, it's a privilege for me to join you today in this very uh, challenging topic. And I would like to say uh, one of uh, the more challenging uh, areas where we need to learn, especially on neuropathic pain. I know uh, a lot of you here uh, have experienced dealing with patients with uh, uh, real challenging uh, neuropathic pain and uh, it's, it's really, really hard. And I would admit it's not only you, but uh, also a lot of us here experience the same thing. So let me just uh, start with uh, this uh, discussion on protein concentration in the form of alpha-2 macroglobulin, which is uh, initially used for severe degenerative joint disease and spine. And uh, you can see a lot of published papers uh, with regards to, this, to that uh, uh, topic. And now I was, I'm using it for nerves, especially for chronic neuropathic pains. So let me begin by citing a beautiful Bible text. And this is found in Isaiah 40, 30 and 31. It says, even the youth shall faint and be weary and the young men shall utterly fall, but they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount with wings as eagles. They shall run and not be weary and they shall walk and not faint. That's almost the, Regenerative medicine encapsulate in a very nice uh, uh, saying here in this chapter, in this verse. So here, uh, our talk will center on, uh, of course, the definition of what is neuropathic pain and chronic pains, and of course, epidemiology, clinical manifestations of uh, this disease, and how we need to diagnose and, uh, and uh, use laboratory tests to find out whether we're really dealing with neuropathic pain because this particular uh, treatment or regenerative interventions is focused on uh, regenerative interventions for neuropathic pain. Uh, aside from the fact that it can also work in other, in other uh, disease condition, but primarily for this uh, talk today, we will concentrate on its effect on neuropathic pain. And of course, images, what, uh, how do we uh, see it in terms of uh, what we, I use as a modality, maybe an MRI, or a lot of us here are using ultrasound. And of course, uh, 
what are the evidences that we have in terms of regenerative interventions for neuropathic pain. So these are this is the flow that you're going to follow as we go along this lecture. Okay, so let me begin by saying that uh, neuropathic pain is a disease by itself where there is a lesion or disease of the somatosensory system. So a lot of the pains that we experience could be caused by musculoskeletal or it could be other uh, causes. But uh, for neuropathic pain per se, it's uh, a disease where there is an actual uh, affectation or lesion of the somatosensory system. And that is why there is this neuropathic pain. And uh, it affects 10% of the general population and uh, it could also involve this uh, type of nerves, A, A beta, A delta, and of course C fibers, which is the one that's observed uh, pain. And it could persist over several months. In fact, it's very challenging. And I'm sure a lot of you here have experienced uh, trying to treat a patients and uh, we, we don't know really what to do. We, we're so frustrated and what uh, the present medical interventions that we know cannot possibly treat the patient. So we go into some other drugs like opioids, opiates, which uh, we thought would also help our patients. So there's a lot of other interventions, of course, that are uh, uh, present in the market that we can also use, especially if we are trained to do uh, interventional under fluoro or under ultrasound. Then, of course, uh, we go into the positive symptoms of neuropathic pain. So uh, it could be uh, differentiated to just the usual pain that we experience. But for neuropathic pain, there is a certain experience of patients where what used to be just touch is perceived to be pain. And so we call it allodynia, uh, a simple touch. Or maybe when we examine a patient and we're just about to hold the patient's arms or legs or any part of the body, then we experience that pain is being provoked by that sensation. And, and so uh, we call that uh, allodynia. And of course, it could be also uh, enhanced and uh, it could the, the simple pain sensation could, could still be um, increased. And so we call it hyperalgesia, or there could just be an abnormal sensation altogether. It could be spontaneous or evoked. Uh, patients could not sleep. And so it, it affects them the whole time, the whole night. And so we call it dysesthesia and could also cause it, uh, abnormal sensation of the legs, hands, or whatever part of the body is involved. So these are the positive symptoms of neuropathic pain. And of course, we have a diagnostic criteria. This was published recently in 2021. And so they identify all these core criteria for defining what neuropathic pain is all about. And if you, call, if you look at this, this is a collaboration of different uh, groups. And uh, we can see that uh, this type of uh, diagnostic criteria seems to give us a more broader uh, idea of what this pain really is all about. Sometimes it could be described by patients as burning, shooting, there could be pins and needles, tingling or electric, or it could just be a dull, aching, throbbing or pressure type of pain. And it could be modulated by other things, psychosocial factors, emotions, and of course, uh, giving us more hard time in coping with our daily activities. And of course, eventually affecting our quality of life. And so there are also screening tools for diagnosis and uh, we have several of them. And uh, you can use this uh, in your practice to be able to identify how to really, really understand what this pain is all about. And so this could be very helpful for you. Uh, you can get details of this uh, in other references, but this, four, this uh, three uh, screening tool is, is very useful, especially in trying to identify whether you're dealing with simple neuropathic pain or maybe myofascial pain, and of course, uh, uh, neuropathic pain. It could also be central or it could be peripheral, depending on whether it is a, a secondary effect of a disease like stroke or spinal cord injury. So these are disease that eventually will cause pain, or it could just be a peripheral type uh, especially post-amputation pain. And interestingly, this, this type of pain is uh, sometimes perceived as 
just because of the pressure where the prosthesis is uh, actually having an interface with the skin. And so there is some sort of a pain because of that pressure. Uh, so that's uh, what, what we found in post amputation pain, or it could be the, the more common trigeminal neuralgia or the pain, painful radiculopathy. So we see a lot of these conditions in our practice, of course. And it could just be any of those disease uh, caused by other uh, disease, for example, uh, diabetes or other metabolic uh, syndromes giving rise to a disease affecting the nerves. Now, if you look at this graph here, you will notice here that uh, the time it takes for anybody to, to diagnose a certain disease such as this disease takes a lot of months. And from the onset of pain to the diagnosis, will take an average of about 24 months, almost two years. And so uh, it's not because you lack information or you lack skill that you're not able to uh, treat a patient, but because it's so hard to really make sure that you're dealing with really neuropathic pain over other types of pain. So it's understandable that it takes you a while before you can come up with your diagnosis. And by the time you make a diagnosis to the treatment also takes another almost two years where you refer the patient to a pain center. And this is a study made in France. And as you can see, the, the time it takes for these patients to be treated takes a lot of time. So this is really something very challenging. And that is why uh, it is an interesting uh, topic that we need to deal. And uh, some of us are probably anesthesiologists and PMNR, a lot of us are PMNR. And so we see this a lot of times. And so we feel frustrated. We, 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 we do all the modalities, the treatment, and yet we don't really uh, reach the point of uh, having the patients experience really relief or maybe just a slight relief after giving all those medications. So here, uh, how do we go about uh, knowing and ensuring that we are dealing with neuropathic pain. So the usual complaint of patients, why they come to us is of course the pain. And of course, we try to get the history, whether there's a neurological uh, lesion or disease, or it could be uh, described by the anatomical distribution. It's, it's easier if we can identify a, a certain symptoms based on whether we're dealing with uh, spinal cord, uh, or root lesions, or it could be a peripheral nerve lesions. And then we try to follow that up by doing some tests. We can probably do EMG or ultrasound, if a lot of you are doing that, or maybe MRI, just to make sure that there is really a problem. And then of course, from there, we, we, we would think, oh, there's possible neuropathic pain. And so we would do further studies and we do diagnostic tests and try to see if indeed this is a a neuropathic pain. And so the time it takes for us to really uh, reach the point of ensuring that we are dealing with the disease takes a little while. But this is a helpful flow of what we need to do when we see a patients with this type of pain. So how do we deal with these uh, patients in terms of the imaging processes involved in identifying a nerve? So first, I would like to introduce these concepts, which was uh, published in a paper by Diaz and uh, colleagues. And he mentioned about the different biomarkers for pain. And of course, as you can see here, uh, there are measurable uh, biomarkers that we can do test for our laboratory, uh, something like the CRP. And of course, uh, uh, some centers would also do some TNF tests. And uh, the more recent ones are the use of microRNAs this is a useful diagnostic and prognostic markers for the onset and progression of chronic pain. And this is also very helpful, especially the MIR-21, especially in painful neuropathies. So this could be a test that we can do in order to find out whether we're dealing with a nerve lesion and uh, that could also explain why that nerve syndrome is causing a lot of pain for the patient especially in this COVID, post-COVID uh, era, where we see a lot of uh, patients who have been given uh, maybe vaccination and they develop allergies and then eventually they develop certain pain that we have a hard time trying to distinguish and treat 
and uh, we, we lost options for what we need to do for all these type of patients. Now, another thing is, of course, uh, we can do histological, which is actually in this paper, uh, we see that when a nerve is painful, it's just well it's swollen. And you can see here the, the, sw the hypochoric swelling of the, of the nerve in, in the tissue when we open it. And then it is also what we see in the histology, you can see here the, the swelling of the nerves. And at the same time, this is also the images that we see. So it's, it's a non-delineated, uh, bizarre hypochoric swelling of, uh, of the nerve. In ultrasound, there's, there's really a diffuse uh, a presence of the fascicles. We cannot identify anymore the borders. And uh, it's, it's so hard to see uh, the details of the borders of the nerves. In that case, uh, this could already develop into your neuroma formation for, for nerve. It could be the interneural, the terminal types of neuron, especially if we're dealing with an injury uh, in, the, in those patients. Now, other things that we can do are uh, these tests, okay? So autoradiography, and uh, this is a, a test where you can see the nerve, and then at the same time, how the neuroma looks like, both histologically and through this imaging using different types of stain. And uh, as you will notice, there are changes in the color and of course in the size, it's, it's hypoechoic, it's swollen. And this is the same uh, nerve that we see also in ultrasound. There's a hypoechoic swelling. So these are uh, pictures that we can use in order to see that we're dealing with a neuropathic pain. Again, this is other uh, test that uh, they're using, both for the uninjured, the one at the, on the top, and the injured nerve here. Uh, we, don't, we don't have this under usual conditions, but I'm just showing it to you for you to see how the nerve uh, looks like when it's pathologic. And of course, uh, this is a picture in ultrasound of a nerve which is uh, already swollen. And you can see here the hyperechoic hypoechoic uh, inflammation that uh, you see in the nerve. And this is a cross-section area of the, of the sciatic nerve. And uh, this is the uh, long axis view. And so you can see a lot of uh, Doppler inflammatory response as a result of that inflammation, especially if you're dealing with a neuroma. And uh, that coincides with the degree of pain that just where the patient uh, feels. And uh, it's interesting that ultrasound is a very helpful diagnostic modality for diagnosing this type of pain. And then of course, uh, how do we explain this? The cellular and physiologic basis of neuropathic pain. Now, first of all, there are two areas by which we can explain this in terms of the peripheral and central neuroinflammatory processes. Uh, let me first start at the dorsal root ganglion level. Now, when there is a pain, usually it sends signals into the spinal cord, and then it usually uh, increases the level of the neutrophils and macrophages over the area of involvement. And then from that area, it goes into the nerve, and the nerve releases uh, pro-inflammatory cytokines in the form of interleukin. It could be interleukin-1 or interleukin-6. These are the pro-inflammatory cytokines. And then it sends signals into the central nervous system and then after that, it sends and releases the microglia. Now, microglia is in the form by either M1 or M2. Now, during the inflammatory phase, there's an increase of M1, but there is a decrease of M2. Now, over, the, over time, when uh, this area is treated, of course, there would be a reverse. There will be an increase in M2 and a decrease in M1. But primarily for an inflammatory uh, inflammation of the nerve, usually the M1 is activated in Greece. And that, that is usually the first one that comes out first during the first 24 hours. And after 24 hours, the astrocytes is activated and this also increased in amount and levels. And they, they make a different cycle here. And then it sends signals going down and the, the pain cycle continues. So this, this activation, this release of the cells cause a lot of inflammation into the cells, especially in the nerves, and causes a lot of patients or pain in the patients. Now, if you look closely at the uh, terminal junction, you, what you will notice here is there are three 
uh, very important substance as the BNF, BDNF, brain-derived neurotropic factor, the glutamate and substance P. Now this has its own receptors at the end level of the dorsal horn. And once there is a nerve injury, now these ones are released. And at the same time, the astrocytes, which mentioned earlier, also releases the pro-inflammatory cytokines together with microglia. And if you'll notice, the microglia is in the form of M1. And this is in an interesting component, especially the interleukin-6 and 1, beta, and TNF-alpha, because these are the ones that is found in any inflammatory cells. Talking about osteoarthritis, spine, nerves, it's usually the same one. In fact, this is the same one also for COVID. So as you can see, the pro-inflammatory cytokines is, is a way by which our body responds to, to a disease. And as a result, this actually promotes the cycle of infl infl inflammation. And this is the same uh, substance that you can also see in, in an inflamed and uh, destroyed nerve. And that is why this is a inver very interesting component of, uh, of the inflammatory response that is to be treated because these are the ones which actually uh, accumulates and give rise to a lot of pain for patients with neuropathic pain. Now here, uh, as I mentioned earlier, the pro-inflammatory macrophage in the form of M1 is released within the, 20, the first 24 hours. And then after that, it's followed by the astrocytes, which persist up to about 12 weeks. It could be more than that, actually. And the M1 is mediated by, uh, of course, the pro-inflammatory cytokines, which may mentioned earlier, interleukin 1 beta, interleukin 6, 10 half alpha. And this is the same substance that also goes into the nerve, which is at the same time goes into the dorsal root ganglion and sends signals up to the brain. And then this cycle continues on and on. And as you can see here in this uh, illustration, then this also finds its way into the blood vessel. And that is why it goes into the specific nerve area and causes all a lot of these uh, responses that we see, which is very, very painful. Now with this condition present, how do we approach it? Now from a medical point of view, of course, uh, the, there are different drugs and we usually start with uh, the usual pain uh, relief drugs, because at the initial uh, evaluation, we do not know yet whether we're dealing with uh, a plain uh, musculoskeletal pain or we're dealing with some sort of other chronic pains. Uh, and we usually don't distinguish between what is the chronic uh, musculoskeletal pain and neuropathic pain. And so, uh, because of that, we gave NSAIDs, and of course, we, we give all these other drugs just in case the NSAIDs doesn't work. And if you will notice here in the drug, for example, now, when we have a clue that there is a radiation of nerve towards the distal part of the legs, we, we, we say, oh, it could be a possible neuropathic pain. So we give drugs such as your gabapentin and pregabalin. And this is a very good drug and considered to be the first line of treatment for neuropathic pain. And if you'll also take a look at other drugs like the most common is the amitriptyline and of course the tramadol, which is part of the, the opioids. These are considered the second line of treatment. In other words, uh, for some, they may start using this, but you will realize that uh, it doesn't really work. So. This is sometimes given if the first line of treatment doesn't work, which is actually the gabapentin and pregabalin, and of course your amitriptyline as well here. So this was a study done by Atal in 2021. So these are the drugs that we normally use to deal with this type of patients. And of course, recently, all of us, or some of us, or maybe most of us are considering using regenerative interventions for neuropathic pain. So what, what are our options? So these are our possible options. So a lot of you are doing PRP, and of course, some are also using uh, bone marrow stem cells and adipose stem cells. And of course, uh, maybe some else would also be using uh, A2M. So uh, we would like to understand exactly how they work 
so that we may be able to understand also how we could address the specific conditions affecting these specific areas. So let's start with the MSCs, which is part of the stem cells. So if you take a look at this illustration here, when MSCs is injected, okay, or maybe incorporated in the treatment protocol, then what used to be the M1, which is the pro-inflammatory macrophage, is converted to M2, okay? So M1 is converted to M2, which actually prevents neuroinflammation right here. And then of course, it could also release exosomes, which is also a powerful uh, intervention for pain. And of course, it could enhance further microRNA secretion. So evidence shows that this type of intervention can actually attenuate neuroinflammation and could also modulate immune system and wound healing. And so we, those of you who are doing this, really experience uh, relief once we do these procedures to our patients. So other things that uh, we also see here is that the stem cells acting on the M1 through these mediators here, GDNF, NGF, and VGF, are the ones also which facilitates the conversion of M1 to M2. And the mitogen activated protein kinase, which is a central role in pain modulations, are also influenced by this intervention as well. So MSCs will have an anti-inflammatory role through the MAPK pathway. In fact, it is also important to highlight here that it also inhibits the expression of PRT1 and over 2, especially in the dorsal root ganglion. Remember, the pain also is, is uh, transmitted from the nerve into the dorsal root ganglion, from the dorsal root ganglion goes up to the level of the brain. So with this, being part of the uh, mechanism, then we could say that relief is anticipated for patients, at least on the theoretical level. So the BMSCs work at the level of the glutamate, also at the, at the receptor sites, and inhibit the expression of NMDA. And then of course, uh, the reason is just to prevent the glutamate hypertoxicity, which is causing a lot of hyperalgesia. It also inhibits glial cell activation, which as we have mentioned earlier, converts M1 to M2. and also inhibits MEPK signal pathway, reduced apoptosis and autophagy of spinal cord cells. And there are other intermediate uh, mechanisms that are acted upon by the PMSCs at that level. So here, this is a recent published in 2022. You can see here the different results of the studies. And as the studies have shown, there are still inconsistent outcomes. Some outcomes are good. Some outcomes are not so good. So we really need to do a lot of uh, further studies in order to really understand how to uh, intervene with neuropathic pain. So there's a lot of research being done presently on this field. And probably some of you here might be interested to be part of that research and come up with how exactly does this work and how exactly does this uh, help relieve pain. Now from the bone marrow stem cells, we move to your PRP on neuropathic pain. And of course, uh, this is a study published in 2020. So the, 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 the patients are usually a diabetic with neuropathic pain. And the study have shown that there is uh, an improvement in terms of, of pain two weeks after the initial injection. And of course, they also compare between, they also compared between PRP and the PPP in terms of nerve regeneration. And they found that PRP is also effective on nerve regeneration. So, as you can see, this is a passive results of using PRP. And for those of you who are using it, you, you can continue using it. This is uh, very useful for your practice. And so it al always helps to use uh, something that could make a difference to your patient. And of course, uh, another study here, and uh, this is 
primarily for neuropathic pain. So they identified the anti-inflammatory effects of PRP. Of course, we cannot yet tell based on the study what are the optimal dosage, the frequency of administration, and at what stage should we do it, the early, middle, or late stages. So again, further clinical studies are needed to understand the mechanism of action in this kind of uh, intervention. Now, still some we are using dextrose 5% water. And so they make a comparative uh, study between PRP and dextrose 5% water, which is also very good for uh, neuropathic pain because it acts on the TRIP-V1 receptor. And so here they compared it for carpal tunnel syndrome and what they found out is that 5% uh, dextrose could be helpful, usually during the first few days, but it doesn't sustain the effect after that. And so the study shows that PRP is more effective than 5% dextrose for mild to moderate carpal tunnel syndrome. So PRP, again, was uh, studied in a systematic review. And then, of course, for mild to moderate CTS. And of course, it has been found out to be superior in terms of improving pain, function, and reducing swelling in the mid nerve for mild long-term effect. And of course, it's validated by the presence of the EMG showing improvement after PRP injection. And of course, another study for platelet rich plasma. So again, here it explains the presence of pre-inflammatory cytokines and glial cells. And it has also its role in trying to counteract the pro-inflammatory cytokines and inhibits the inflammatory response through PKM2 mediated glycolysis and astrocyte activation. So in a way, you can see that this is used, very useful also for neuropathic pain. And of course, uh, for chronic inflammatory pain, PRP also has, has been found out to be very effective and uh, it also inhibits uh, inflammation through a different pathway. And also in this case, uh, PKM2 mediated aerobic glycolysis and the one which we previously mentioned. It also effective for re regeneration by increasing NGF. And uh, interestingly, the NGF has been found out to be a very good factor that you can find in, in PRP, but at the same time, it's very painful. So th that's, that's the reason why when you inject PRP, you always have to tell your patients that it's going to be painful because of the presence of nerve root factor. And of course, uh, it, could be, it could also facilitate nerve regeneration, especially for traumatic uh, injury of the nerve. Now we'll move to uh, alpha-2 macroglobulin. So here, uh, usually, in my practice, the choice of doing H2M is really the last options that I offer to my patients because when everything fails, you, you start doing your medications, you start doing your dextrose or doing your PRP, and it still did not work. And that is where I would consider doing an A2M. Although studies here are very, very limited. And so we're focusing on what we have available so far. And it's very interesting that this, pub, this study was published April 20, 2022, and they compare different uh, types of solutions for neuropathic pain. This is a systematic review. And they try to explain the neuroinflammation that is ongoing in the nerve, especially for those patients with diagnosed case of neuropathic pain. And the study, unfortunately, have uh, uh, given us a very limited uh, support at this point. And if you'll notice, evidence is very low in support of injectable biologics for neuropathic pain treatment. And what they found out is uh, A2M so far was used for pudendal neuralgia and thoracic outlet syndrome. And then these are not standard care treatments as of the present. So more studies still are needed to be able to use these types of modality at present. And of course, uh, in the past, this is a, uh, a paper published January 2017, 
and A2M was used for spine problems, back pain. And uh, the first thing that they need to do is to identify whether the patient is FAC positive. So fibronectin aggregate complex is a biomarker for uh, patients with spine problems. And if it, if it is FAC positive, usually it will respond to an intradiscal A2M injection. In other words, those patients which are FAC negative will not uh, have any good effect for patients with low back pain or spinal pain for that matter. So this is also studied specific for patients with FAC passive markers. And then of course, uh, this is a treatment for uh, pelvic pain syndrome. So they injected in the Alcox canal for the podendal nerve and use a head dissection technique. And uh, it shows a very good effect using an HM. But as I've said, uh, it's too early to, to say that uh, uh, this type of treatment is part of the usual standard of care. And then of course, uh, another study for HM and neuropathic pain. And you can see here the, the mechanism of action is the protease inhibition, and it actually acts on the pro-inflammatory cytokines, remember what we mentioned, interleukin 1B, interleukin 6, and TNF alpha. Uh, it has a pro-anti-inflammatory effect on those cytokines, but at the same time, it inhibits the inflammatory proteases such as the MMPs or matrix proteases. And at the same time, if it is injected on the joints, it also slows the cartilage degeneration through enhancing activities of catabolic enzymes. In this case, they use it for uh, thoracic outlet syndrome, which is usually a nerve problem. And they use the PPP portion of the plasma. So while PRP uses the PRP portion, the H2M is taken from the platelet pore portion of the plasma. Now this uh, study, of course, this is a um, narrative review. Uh, we published this in June 28, 2020, and we explained how H2M solution works. We need to have at least six times to eight times con concentration to enhance recovery and regeneration of an, of an injured nerve. And at present, uh, uh, we only have limited um, ways by which we can extract the H2M from the blood. And usually, it takes about 60 to 120 cc of blood to be able to come up with a six times to eight times concentration. It suppresses neuroinflammation and alters the course of peripheral nerve. And of course, it inhibits pro-inflammatory cytokines, such as the one we mentioned, interleukin 1B, interleukin 6, in TNF alpha. So we prepare it by, by the way we prepare for PRP. So here in this case, we run, we run the, the, the plasma, the blood, and get the poor little poor plasma by using the XLPC uh, technique. And then if you still would like to use the PRP, you can still do that. But in this case, we certainly would like to do the PPP portion only. And then we were using a filter. This is a specialized type of filter. And then from the filter, we run it in such a way that the filter goes, uh, is processed using this technique. It will probably have a different uh, different uh, workshop for this on how to process this. And uh, we have only limited time to talk about how it's being processed. But at least you can see here that there is stages of how this is being processed. And then of course, from the A2M being processed, I usually do the photo activation because photo activation is found out to enhance the growth factors that is needed during the procedure. And then that's where we do the injection after the process. So here is an example of a patient. This is a 47-year-old patient with pain on the left, left gluteal area uh, for two years. And he has been, she has been suffering from pain and has been receiving uh, medications such as pregabalin and neurontin, but uh, no sustained effect. And I started also doing first dextrose 5%. And uh, he was, she was relieved for about two weeks to about uh, four weeks. 
and then the patient comes back again. Then he said, doctor, do you, do, you, do you have other options? And so I said, I can probably do PRP. And so we did PRP. And then a uh, patient uh, was relieved for maybe about uh, two to three months. And then he comes back again until we decided, okay, let's try to do uh, A2M this time. And so we, we were doing a hydrodissection of the sciatic nerve using A2M. Okay, this is the, the video of uh, how we did it. And we are, we are doing it just at the top of the, between the a great trochanter and the ischium, okay? Then at the inferior gemellus area, just below your uh, gluteus medius. And the patient experienced relief and it's been like uh, six months now and the patient has not yet come back. And uh, I just hope uh, he's well right now. Uh, we, we have not followed her up yet. And uh, that's the images that we did for the H1M. Now we have another patient here with a 61 year old with recurrent numbness in the left upper extremity, pain with associated weakness in the fourth and fifth digits. And so uh, we, di we diagnosed this with, with an ulnar uh, lesion at the cubital tunnel. And so we did uh, several treatments ahead of that, medications, and so the physical therapy, and then eventually the patient decided to have an A2M. And so uh, this one, I was using the A2M by, by Apex, and this is uh, a long axis approach of the ulnar nerve. And then we noticed that after two days, after the treatment, the patient reported that it was already gone. I said, are you saying it's, it's done already? I said, yes. And I, I followed her up after two months and the pain is no longer there. And I hope to follow her up probably after six months and uh, try to see and document uh, what is the progress of this treatment. So H2M is such uh, a potential for uh, using it for neuropathic pain. And with patients being treated after all other treatments were done, could be really a key to using it for neuropathic conditions. And uh, this is a very simple procedure. And uh, this is available in, uh, in our uh, uh, APEX system. And you can use it. And it's very user friendly. You can follow it up and you can just uh, try start, uh, you can start using this in your practice. And so in summary, the diagnosis of neuropathic pain is a complex and challenging process and uh, the available medications will not provide usually long-term relief. It could be a combination of drugs and other modalities that we can use. And there is a potential of considering it for genital treatments. And of course, from what we have seen, there's a lot of need to do further studies about this condition and about the intervention which is available. But at the same time, H2M is giving us great promise as a new uh, interventional solution for neuropathic pain. So I think uh, this is all for today. And I would like to thank everyone. Thank Dan Crane for uh, allowing me to share these uh, slides with you and this lecture with you. And I hope uh, you learned something today. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you, Dr. De Castro. Appreciate that. Um, looks like we do have some questions. And again, for those who didn't hear at the beginning, if you'd like to ask Dr. De Castro some questions, the easiest way to do that is just type that in the Q&A section down below. And, um, and I'll read them off and he can answer them as we go. So please jump in and do that. Um, the Let's see. So let's just dive right into it. Uh, one question is, will these slides be available after Zoom? And yes, we can send a recorded uh, link to this lecture after, um, Sean will send it out to you after the lecture. So, and for those that maybe only caught half of the uh, lecture came in late, then you'll have access to, to be able to watch that whole thing. Um, okay, here's a question. Curious to hear your thoughts on PRP versus platelet lysate. Uh, for nerves. Okay. Uh, yeah, 
as I've shown you earlier in the lecture, uh, PRP is also useful for nerves. But what I'm saying is there are conditions really that is very challenging. And uh, after using PRP, because you have really used PRP in the beginning, it, it's the response is not so good. I mean, you didn't, you didn't expect the, 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 you don't have any relief at all. And so the, the next step that you can do is to consider doing A to M because that's exactly what, what we're doing right now. We're, we're still using PRP actually for nerve conditions, but there are cases which are very challenging and we do not have any options. Uh, of course, we mentioned about bone marrow stem cells, of course, PRP, but for those patients who would not spend so much with probably bone marrow or other things, uh, they might consider doing an A to M, which is very accessible and which has been found to be, in terms of my practice, we are still doing a paper right now comparing PRP and A to M. It has been found to be superior with uh, against PRP. So, uh, yeah, you can still so, use PRP to answer that question. And so a follow-up question from the same person, do you combine the two ever? Or, um, or when do you choose to favor one over the other? Okay, usually, as I've mentioned, PRP has a lot of NGF, nerve root factors, and it's usually very painful. So the initial response after the treatment is the patient would have uh, an exacerbation of pain more than relief. In the case of A2M, you can already experience pain uh, relief right away. I mean, the relief is, is, uh, is, is felt by the patient within the first day, in fact, uh, some patients have said uh, in the first two days, which is not uh, typical of PRP. So, and and the results, especially I have a patient with a with a with an amputation pain, uh, with a compression of sciatic nerve. It's been two years now. In fact, three years already, and there's no pain at all. I've tried PRP before, but he responded well with uh, with PRP. I would not combine A2M with PRP because the component of A2M is different from the component of PRP. If you do that, then you might as well just do the PRP without doing an A2M. Okay. And so specifically, if there are different joints or different treatment areas, um, are you, do you personally favor A2M in, in all cases or are there cases where you favor PRP or, or even bone marrow stem cell? Well, I would favor A to M. Uh, maybe I'm biased, but uh, in spite of the fact that I've already done PRP, uh, I can see that to, you know, patients would come to you with a very limited budget. And uh, sometimes they, they can, the economic portion of that is has to be considered. And so if I do PRP together with A to M, then it might be costly for her or, yeah, but since in the processing component of Apex, you can actually have both. You can get the PRP and at the same time, uh, the A2M. I wouldn't choose the PRP portion for nerves. If, if he has some other diseases where I can use that, I would use that for probably joints or other things, but not for nerves. I would specifically use A2M for nerves alone. Okay, that's great, perfect. And um, this is a great question because it, it really probably is the most used area. I'll just read the question. Does, does A2M work in the knee for OA? Or, um, yeah, yes, yes, yes. And maybe yeah. explain how or why that's so impactful. Okay, uh, that's a very nice question because you sh uh, initially the, the, the use of A2M was really intended for severe joint problems because it, it actually inhibits cartilage, further cartilage degeneration. That was the, and it inhibits MMPs. So that was what was intended initially. But over time, when you look at the mechanism, you will also see that it has a pro-inflammatory, the, the pro-inflammatory cytokines, which is present both in the joints and the nerves are the same. And so you figure it out and then you say, why not use it for nerves? Because anyway, the component is the same. And that is where H2M comes in because it has a direct effect against interleukin-1, interleukin-6, and TNF-alpha, which are the pro-inflammatory cytokines. And that is where this mechanism is targeted against. Perfect. 
So another question, what about carpal tunnel syndrome? Would you, what kind of rigid medicine would you use in a carpal tunnel syndrome, if, if any? Yeah, there's a lot of studies already saying that PRP works for carpal tunnel. But there are cases which, uh, if in the process of treating carpal tunnel, you don't get relief, then probably it's it's time to use A2M. But a lot of studies have already proven that, carpal, uh, that PRP works for carpal tunnel. Perfect. All right. Uh, um, I have a comment here. It says the filter will also uh, concentrate IRAP and other larger proteins like uh, fibro fibronogen. So won't that also help with anti-inflammatory option in this experience? Like getting... Think, yeah, we're, we're coming from Don. Yes. Yeah, that's Don. Don is an expert, so he knows everything. So... <laughs> I would say I agree. <laughs> so yeah, great insight from Dr. Buford uh, from yeah. Texas. Thank you, Dr. Buford. Um, it seems okay. This is a great question. It seems like it's a it's a shame to toss out PRP. I, I know a lot of physicians combine the two together, um, and so maybe expand on that. If if you to to be able to obtain the protein concentration, you you're getting PRP anyway, and so. Um, do you toss that out or, or what would you recommend with that PRP? Okay. I'm not, I'm not here to toss out PRP. And as I've said, <laughs> there are useful indications for PRP, but what, what we're saying here is that you can still use PRP. Okay. Especially when the patient comes to you for the first time and you don't want to, you know, uh, use that jump off to HM right away. But what we're saying is there are cases which are not responsive to PRP and you probably lose that opportunity to treat the patients because PRP doesn't work for him, for her, whatever. And so it's, it's good to consider something else that you have in your choices of treatments and that would include your A2M. So in other words, you have, you've used PRP, but you find out that it's really didn't work and so it's time to use HM. So we're not entirely saying we are tossing out PRP. We're just, you know, if it if it is well found to to really not work, then you can you can consider using PRP because it, at this time we really need a lot of studies yet to be able to say and establish the fact that HM is much 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 superior to PRP. Perfect. Oh, that's great. And so another question, do you only inject A2M once or do you find yourself doing it a series of time, like after, you know, three or four or five months or whatever? Usually for each nerve, I would just do two, two for each nerve, because depending okay. on what nerve is affected, let's say media nerve and the carpal tunnel, I would just use two, two sessions, uh, two weeks apart or one week apart, it depends. So I would usually, uh, yeah. Okay. So one or two weeks apart. Yeah. And two okay. sessions, most, most. Okay. And what is the typical volumes of A2M that you use? Okay, if you actually process 120 cc, you'll be able to get eight times concentration. If you process, I would usually process uh, 80, 80 cc. At 80 cc, you'll be able to get at least four to six times concentration. Okay, perfect. Um, lots of good questions, let's see. I think this one is very nice. Anonymous. Go ahead. You yeah, if you see one that catches yeah. your go for it. Which which nerves do you target for the abatic neuropathic pain? Many patients have normal nerve conduction studies since it is usually small nerve fiber term. Okay. You know what what is very interesting in the in the mechanism is that I would go I would go treat patients starting from proximal to distal. The reason is if you go into small nerves, it's very hard to to see them even if you're using an ultra frequency ultrasound. It would be very diff difficult to really distinguish each branches. So usually my pattern of treatment will go from proximal to distal, where the most impingement is noticed, noted at the, at the proximal part, then that's where I would inject and then work, work my way down into the small fiber branches, especially for diabetic neuropathy. So I would not go into the details of small nerves because these are very fine nerves. You don't, you hardly see that. 
even if you're using a high frequency type, otherwise you may be using the 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 70 megahertz type of ultrasound, which is which is rare in our practice unless uh, somebody lends you that kind of ultrasound. Yeah. If he's talking just like perfect. Uh, let's see. Oh, there's another question here. Yeah, go ahead. Go for By it. Don, the Cytonics A2M, okay, and the and the HM that we're using. Yeah, initially it was the cytonics only that produces A to M. And the process is kind of lengthy because you have to process it several times over with, with the A to M extracted at the bottom of that uh, of that process. And that that was that kind of system was indicated initially for spine and for severe joints. I have not yet uh, compared the effect the effectiveness of using that technique or technology versus that of the filter, and uh, uh, to be done, that would, that might be a very good uh, way of comparing this different uh, system, and find out which one is superior to the other. Sixty. All right. Um... Is A to M more anti-inflammatory than IRAM? Okay, we just published a book and we tried to compare these two. And uh, I would say it's hard to quantify actually uh, which one has superior to the other. Uh, but I think in the initial stages, IRAP is considered to be uh, very anti inflammatory. But right now, I would say. Uh, the technology has uh, has evolved into something that uh, we could also try to uh, use. And uh, since a lot of us maybe have experience using IRAP, and uh, we haven't actually compared these two, uh, to be honest, and it would be a good thing to really find out which one is more anti-inflammatory than the other. But I would say it has a direct effect on the pro-inflammatory cytokines. That's what I know so far. Okay. Perfect. And then, uh, are you familiar with any studies uh, on A2M for tendinopathy? Not yet. Not yet. Not yet. Perfect. <clears throat> um, I think we're at, uh, we've been an hour, so I think we'll wrap it up. But if there's any other questions, please uh, email Sean and he can he can reach out to Dr. DeCastro and get any other questions answered. Um, Apex Biologics is really, really excited to announce our brand new filter. This is unlike any filter out there in the market. Uh, increased efficiency, faster processing, easier to use, higher concentrations. Uh, one of the questions was how much, I think, um, protein concentrate do you get out of, uh, you know, a, a sample of. And so if you've got, let's just say, 60 cc's of blood, you end up with 35 uh, cc's or mls of, of platelet poor plasma that will produce five to eight mls of protein concentrate so kind of give you an idea of, of uh, typically in a sample of 60 cc's of blood you'll get about five to six uh, five to seven cc's of prp and and uh and about that same amount in protein concentrate but anyway for anyone that's interested in these uh, new filters please reach out uh, to our team. Uh, they're in stock now and they are phenomenal. It's, we've worked really hard to get this thing into the market, um, partnered with really great manufacturer to make this for us. Um, Dr. Castro, again, thank you for your time. We look thank forward you to well. seeing a lot of you in, uh, in Park City in Salt Lake for our next, uh, the, the next Advanced Regenerative Medicine Institute conference. Uh, everyone have a wonderful evening. Thank you very much. And Dr. DeCastro in Philippines, have a wonderful morning. Yes, thank you very much, uh, Dan, for inviting me. And uh, thank you also for the rest of you here who have joined us today. Hopefully you learned something today. Thank you very much.